is Elaine Khan, who will share what it was like last summer to have her son, her son serving in the Israeli army in the war in Gaza. I know you've been sitting a really long time. Um, some really uh, wonderful speakers so far, so I'm honored to be up here for a few minutes and share with you an experience um, that I went through, which is not um, unusual amongst Israeli mothers. I think every Israeli mother uh, was at um, during last summer, my inspiration. So, again, I don't think what I went through was unusual, but I'll tell you a little bit about what happened last summer. I was actually in Israel with all three boys of mine. Missiles were flying into Tel Aviv. Josh my oldest, the soldier, and uh, the lone soldier in Israel, uh, was called to his base. And uh, his training with his group as a sergeant was not completed, and they were going down to the Negev to this place that's actually a fake city. It's a fake Palestinian city where they do anti terrorist training. So Despite what was going on, this was his schedule, and he left. And as things kind of uh, revved up in Israel at that time, um, he called to let me know uh, two days before uh, the other two boys and I were to leave that he was going to be sent in as part of the ground troops. I didn't think that was going to happen because he wasn't done training. He was done with his training, but his group wasn't done with their training. I had a lot of questions. Everything became a question. Everything in my life became a question. What I thought, what I believed in. I took the opportunity to arrange a meeting with Joshua by going down to his base, which was not allowed. The morning of the meeting, there were missiles bombarding the area. He called me at about 6 a.m. when I was about to leave with the two younger boys and said, don't come, it's not safe. The roads, everything. I said, I'm coming. By a miracle, and thank God, and this is the one message of my talk today, is giving thanks to God for everything. There was a four hour ceasefire window. The minute I left with the two boys sleeping in the back of the car, to the time I went to visit Joshua and the time we got back. Literally, from beginning to end, there was the exact amount of time I needed. I got to his base. He was disgustingly filthy. It was indescribable. I, I almost didn't know it was him. He was so schmutzy and smelly. He said, I need batteries. My flashlight is running out. They're sending us in, and I don't know how long we're going to be in for. I want to go get batteries. So down, you know, in Israel, everything's kind of close. Even though to Israelis, everything is kind of far. There was a kibbutz nearby. And you know, all kibbutzim have these little stores on their location. They sell everything in these little stores. So we went to this nearby kibbutz, which was this beautiful oasis. It was idyllic. Uh, the store was open um, miraculously at 8 a.m. We got his batteries. Um, while we were in the store, I said, Josh, I want you to get in a journal. I want you to get something to write on 
that will be with you always because they're not going to let him take in his phone. He's not going to have any form of communication. So um, we took the time to pick out uh, something he could write in that would fit in the back of his pocket and a pen, and we were off. The kids and I left Israel to come back the next day. The airport was almost closed down, but we got out. I left Joshua at that meeting with one question that was in my head over and over and over before I dropped him back off at the army base. I sent the two little ones, they're not so little, but I sent them away, I wanted privacy. And the question was, knowing my son, he was the sweetest, kindest, most eager to please little kid. He's a builder. He's not a destroyer. He shared. He was empathetic, compassionate, human being. I had this question inside of me, like burning a hole in my soul. This boy of mine, in my heart, could not hurt anyone. How could I send him into the situation, let him go in the situation, knowing what I knew? It, 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 it would be awful. So I had to confront him. And I asked him, point blank, can you really hurt someone? You need to own up to this. If you can't, you need to step down. And he said to me the following, he said, I'd give anything for this not to be happening. But since it's happening, I don't want to be any place else than here and doing my duty to protect Israel. And he looked into my eyes and I knew my answer. I was given my answer that this beautiful young man who I taught to share, and he was so good, so good, true and true, he was going to do what he had to do. So I left on that airplane with the other two boys. And as I came home, I noticed the overall sensation of A, the first thing was I didn't get to hear from him. I was told by everyone they would switch these guys in and out every five to seven days. All they had to do was wait five to seven days. Never happened. Not a word. About 10 days into this, his adopted father said, called me from Israel. He had an adopted family in Israel. All lone soldiers get these amazing Israeli families that take them on. And he said, we're sending out messages. We're trying to find out what's going on. He should have been out. We don't know what's going on. We'll let you know. He contacted me back. He said he's not getting out. For some reason, he's in too deep, and it's more dangerous to bring his troop out and send a new troop in than to just keep him where he is. I became lonelier and lonelier, lonelier, lonely alone. I became fully alone. My praying became a practice like 24-7. I was exhausted from praying. I developed like an embryonic sac around my, my son, in my heart, in my mind, um, extolling his virtues to, to Hashem, reasoning with Hashem, the reason why this young man should let, be let to live out his life. I prayed so much that I, I stopped, I became exhausted from the questioning, the, the praying, the asking. And something transformed in me. Something monumental shifted. I became a listener. I started listening for God. I started listening for the answers. I started listening like I was in a silent tank where there was nothing else but this waiting and waiting and waiting Waiting to hear from Josh, nothing. Waiting to hear an answer, nothing. 
then something happened. Right. So I wrote. I wrote to Joshua every day to keep him in my heart, to keep him close to me. Keep being positive. Stay connected. I read a book called To the End of the Land by an Israeli author, David Grossman. It's about a mother whose son who goes into the army. How perfect was that? It's like Hashem gave me everything I needed for this time. God was very good to me. I finally got a call from Joshua's old roommate in Tel Aviv. It was about 3 a.m. I was in, on a mountain in Vermont. He told me that Josh is alive. He got a note that he snuck out to somebody who was leaving. The note was texted to me. It was from that journal I gave him. It was a scrawl. It was his writing. It was my first contact. It said, I'm okay, which is code word for not great. Josh always said everything's great. Okay, so just the fact he said okay, I knew things were really bad. It said, please don't, do not worry too much. That's Josh. He knows I'm going to worry. <laughs> I know you are praying for me. I love you. And that was it. The good news is two and a half weeks later, he got out. His adopted parents went to get him. The next thing was another miracle. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, a billion times. The Israeli army partnered with the Israeli Hotel Association, partnered with LL Airlines. The three of them came together overnight in a meeting, decided to fly in the parents of all these lone soldiers who served in Gaza for free to come see our sons before Rosh Hashanah last year. Joshua called me up and said, what are you doing this week? I said, are you getting married? He said, no. <laughs> he laughed. I said, what's going on? He goes, can you come to Israel this week? I said, what, where would I get money for a ticket like that? And he's like, no, the, uh, these people are paying for it, you know, this partnership. But they need to know if you want to go. You'd be put on the list. They're going to call you within the next three hours for your flight. You'd have to leave tomorrow. Can you go? I said, I'm coming. And they invited my youngest son, too. Solomon was in school. I asked him, do you want to go? I texted him at, at, while he was at school. He didn't even wait a second. He said, I'm coming. We went. We got there. It was a wonderful experience what these people did. God is good. Israelis are good. They got it. They got what this did to me. They went out of their way and brought the parents of these boys and girls because they knew what we went through. We didn't get to be in Israel during this period. It's very hard here to not be with your child, to not be close. So when I saw Josh, he reached out his hand with this book, this journal. Remember the journal? That little journal. Okay, it didn't look like the little journal. It was really pretty beaten up and looked like, ugh, it was very dirty. And he said, I'm not ever going to talk about what happened, but I want you to read what I wrote, if you want to read it. I didn't want to read it. I'm his mother, and there are some things that should remain private. But he was offering it to me. So I went with my gut and I read it. I needed to be his witness. I needed to be his compassionate witness. Our children need that from us. Everybody needs somebody in their life that can just be there and hear our story. Not judge it, not even comment on it, just listen. So whether you become that listener or you need a listener, I really suggest it, especially for your children. Even the hardest, ugliest, darkest places they and me have gone to. The last thing I want to share with you 
is that I had to face the reality that Joshua was going to come out of this severely damaged. He might be alive, but this event was going to affect him. The second version was that he would be killed. The third version was the worst. He could be kidnapped and tortured for who knows how long. They were realistic options. I wasn't making it up in my mind. And I own up to reality. And the thing is, we all die. My son at the age of 21 years old knowingly went and faced death. As his mother, I had to face the death of my beautiful child. But I want to say that death is a gift. It makes, it makes you know what you are. It makes you know who you are. I read of a story of a 14-year-old boy who choked to death, a perfectly healthy boy, 14 years old, choked to death on his food. A 20-year-old girl going on a bus to go see her friends on vacation, accident happened, she died. She was one of the only people who died. But she died on the bus, going on vacation. My son lived up to who he was. He had a higher calling. He could have avoided this whole thing. He wasn't born in Israel. He didn't have to do this. He could have said, you know, I'm not really a killer. Put me in an office someplace. He lived up to his integrity. And from him, I learned, in, I learned courage. Everything I do now shifted because of the last summer, because of Joshua, because he chose to live his life and stand up where he was put, not run. So in knowing that our lives are not forever, knowing that we could have a week, a day, a year, three years, love your children, Love your parents. Just love. Be honest. Be open. Ask your questions. Connect. And have courage. And thank God. Thank you. Any? Thank you very much, Elaine.